I've been advised by a doctor to not move around very much, and so we're gonna be really, really gentle during this episode. <laughs> Why does everybody hate summer wardrobes generally or just clothes for hot weather? That's a good question. Oddly enough, when I first started collecting clothes, I really relished my summer wardrobe specifically because I just couldn't afford anything that was warm. On a more technical level, I think that the reason people get annoyed about summer clothes is that there's not really a way to manipulate your silhouette with summer clothes. And that's not necessarily a like, oh, I want like my clothes to like thin me out or whatever. A lot of us who are really deep into fashion and thinking about it all the time, we really get fixated on interesting silhouettes and sort of creating this like billowy, like when you walk into a room, it's like, I am an event. It's just not really possible to do that unless you're wearing multiple layers. Ultimately, I think it just limits everybody's options and that's really frustrating. But this does kind of connect to another question that we had, which I can now answer as like a segue thing. Yeah, here we go. What contributes to regional styles? LA versus New York versus London, etc. So I think that mostly the places where people are complaining about having to wear their summer clothes are mostly places that have seasons. So it's like, wow, it was really cold here, but now it's really hot and I can't wear my cool coat that I love so much. Whereas if you go to some place like LA, you will find people who are wearing t-shirts and shorts all year round. And so they have come up with a lot of really creative things to do with them. I think for those of us that do live in parts of the world where we do have winter and then we have summer and we experience both pretty extremely, it's just really frustrating to have to only be able to wear shorts and t-shirts. To walk out the second question a little bit more here, what contributes to regional styles, LA versus New York versus London? I think a lot of that does have to do with just the weather of those different locations. For example, like the London style is largely, I, the number one thing that I think of when I think of like London style, sorry people from London, is like Stone Island. <laughs> I know that everyone in Europe sort of thinks of Stone Island as this like brand that's super trashy and that like everybody hates. Americans think that shit is so unbelievably cool. But yeah, I mean, it, it rains a lot there. It's very cold. You guys are only, it's only hot in London for like a couple of days out of the year, right? So you guys live by your heavy winter coats. Whereas here where I, I live in the American South, like out in the middle of nowhere, I'm going to give you an example. Give me two seconds. So for everybody else around the world, this is, a, this is a Canada Goose jacket. We did work with Canada Goose, a consulting job, and they are the only company in the whole wide world that I would ever say this to, but when they said, great, what are your consulting fees? I said, tell you what, if we just do a jacket for me and a jacket for my wife, I think we can call it even. And they said, great, which one do you want? And I was like, I want the, the fucking Everest one. So I got the one that when like, kind of looks like a house. Okay, so I'm very excited that I own that. And like when we went to Berlin Fashion Week, I absolutely had that with me and it came in very close handy. <sighs> close handy, what does that mean? But I'm not joking, for, for as ubiquitous as Canada Goose is in like say New York or in London, where I live, no one has heard of it. Someone came over to our house for dinner and they saw that coat hanging up and one of them was like, oh, what does that logo mean? I saw that like all over the place in New York, but I have no idea what it is. No one here knows who Canada Goose is. But I mean, yeah, that's like literally one of the best jackets that humankind has ever come up with. So yeah, I think a lot of it is just determined by the weather that naturally happens in those places. New York tends to get really, really, really cold. It gets so cold in New York that they invented their own phrase for it. Brick. Serious question, do people actually still say brick in New York? Just to close it out on this question, they also asked which regional style do you like the most? Probably Tokyo. I mean, yeah, super basic answer, but it's Tokyo. Oh my gracious, and what is this? Stylepedia. I use fashionary books all the time. They're one of the most helpful resources in my personal library. This highlights, how many subcultures? One, two, three, four. Well, it's easily over 100. I own a lot of fashion books. There isn't anything that's really offering this on this same scale. When you first get started learning about fashion, it feels like everything is infinitely deep and that there's no way to just get a clean overview of everything. This divides all major subcultures into a hundred different categories and it treats all of them the same, giving you a crash course in each one. Like the space age aesthetic from the 60s. This movement was unbelievably important to the development of modern fashion, but most people can't name the three designers that were part of this movement. It's Courage, Raban, and Cardin. Like, can you find a crash course on C-Punk out on the internet? Probably so. Can you find an accurate, nice, boiled down crash course online for what metalheads are? No. They've already done that research for you. Buy the book. Use code BLISS10 on the website. I don't even make any money from that. That code is for you, my love. Thank you, Fashionary. You are so cool. 
Is a fashion runway show still the best format to show and sell a collection with the tech of today? Yes and no. What fashion runway shows provide for designers is a format that is very well established and extremely recognizable and very sparse. All of us are very used to seeing like brand collection videos and stuff, little like promo short films and stuff, but the general public, most people, and frankly, most of the people that are giving the money are not like fashion obsessives. They're people who are just looking to buy a coat. There is no like established thing in the mind of the public as to what a fashion promotional collection video is. But a fashion runway show, everyone generally knows what that looks like. So if you want to kind of jump out of the box and try something really crazy, that's much easier to do in a format that is well established in the minds of the public. There's also, okay, you're really going to have to stick with me throughout this or else it's going to make no sense and just sound like gobbledygook. I guess the impetus is kind of on me to explain it well. It's not your fault if, if it sounds like gobbledygook. An enormous part of being a successful fashion designer is being able to contextualize your work. The way that people dress that is like the most convenient, the most flattering, looks the best on them, is easiest to take care of and stuff. We've figured out most of that stuff. It is on clearance right now at JCPenney or Primar Primark or whatever you want to go to that sells super cheap clothes. If someone just wants to dress conveniently, flatteringly, and as easily as possible, that is available for next to no money. Designers, in order to sell their collection, have to immerse the, per the people who are going to buy it, buyers and press and all these other people, they have to immerse those people in this world that they're building for the show. Sometimes they do that very successfully, like the recent Margiela collections that were done over COVID. They made these swalk videos that were incredibly immersive. They were a ton of fun to watch, and I felt like I was much closer to that collection having watched them, even though I had never been in the room with that collection. But generally, in order to create that immersion, you don't want somebody sitting at the same office that they sit in every single day, in the same chair, looking at the same laptop, being in a room full of people that they kind of would rather not be at on this Monday morning, looking at their laptop and being like, oh my gosh, I'm starting to feel sick and it's only 11 a.m. Ugh, okay, let's open up this email from Givenchy and see what they showed this year. That's not a good environment for someone to say, yeah, we're going to buy a ton of this shit. The environment that wraps you up in that collection and convinces you that this is the way forward is probably more likely going to happen in a beautiful room in Paris where you're surrounded by a bunch of really well-dressed, cool people who are also sitting and watching this show where there's loud music that you already really like and watching a bunch of models that you're a fan of. And more so, and this is something that's very, very difficult to explain, being in the room, the physical room with someone who's wearing a piece of clothing is very different than anything that's on a flat screen. It just looks different. And I don't know how to explain that to you. Most of the time, if I'm being honest, most of the time in person, it looks worse. We've been to a lot of shows where I looked at videos later and I was like, geez, is this the same collection? <laughs> and so I think a lot of the buyers, the buyers are the, the main people that we're talking about here because they're the ones that are gonna make the most money immediately for those brands. I think a lot of buyers are just like, man, look, I've been around the block a few times and I know that that doesn't look good. And so the designer, by inviting them to Paris, bringing them into this room, giving them a coffee, letting them have like a little croissant or whatever while they watch the show, they're able to say like, look, I will prove to you. The idea is awesome. You've got to get this collection. There are a lot of fashion videos that I've seen there. I'm like, wow, that is just unbelievably beautiful. Like the recent Burberry video. I mean, that's, it's awesome. Like I, it's hard for me to watch this and not smile. I'm smiling just thinking about it. Is that a replacement for a runway show? No, it's not. And I don't think that Burberry thinks of it as a replacement for a runway show because they did a runway show. The thing is that like now that the pace of everything is so fast that most brands are like, if we have a good idea for a video, we'll make that. But of course, obviously we're doing a runway show as well, which is part of the overall problem of designers have too much to do. There's like way too much going on and you can keep up with this if you're like one of the top eight luxury brands in the world. But otherwise you just are gonna like spin yourself into oblivion because you can't keep up with it. Ultimately, if what you're asking here is, is there a way to make it where people watching a screen are able to get closer to the experience Experience of touching things and trying them on? No. There is, there is no technological advancement that has made that any higher fidelity. I mean, I'd love to be proved wrong about this, but I would be shocked if VR was able to fix that and there's no amount of like good filming that's going to be able to communicate what wearing a dress feels like. Are there any details that you gravitate towards when it comes to clothes? For example, I love cool buttons. Oh my gosh, that's so crazy. I also love cool buttons. This shirt by Layer Zero has leather buttons. I don't know if you can see those, but they are super cool. 
I love touching them and getting to handle them every time I wear this shirt. There's also cool stuff. I don't see again, I, I feel like we're gonna have a difficult time showing this, but there's a lot of stuff going on here that does not have like a, a practical purpose behind it, but you know, it's just cool. It's just cool stuff. It clasps together using the leather button and then also like this little guy here, which you know, is not practical at all because this comes undone all day long and I love refastening it every single time. What else? Uh, there's also this bizarre detail of um, the shoulder seam. These are either dead end seams or scar stitches. That's the number one hint that this is not my house. What person under the age of 50 is like, functional grandfather clock, yes. I guess the short answer to your question is that I just like details. If, if there's one like starting point where I'm just gonna be like, no, if it's not there, it's like, I, I need the textile to be good. Um, if we're doing something with polyester, it needs to be as purposeful as Comme de Garcon or Pleats Please, otherwise, I, 20% polyester, I don't, I don't even wanna put it on, forget it. Cause it's just such a telltale sign that we're cutting corners. There are lots of exceptions to that. I generally take 20%, 50%, 70% poly or, you know, rayon or however they want, polyethylenamide. Poly There's plastic in the clothes. I tend to not like it. I'm wearing an exception right now. This is Dickie's Material by Shinya Kazuka, who makes uh, basically the only pants that I can tolerate wearing right now. I love Shinya Kazuka's pants. He uses Dickie's fabric. It's incredible. It's stain resistant. They they keep their shape really well. I, I love these pants, but this is a big ol' exception to the rule. Pleats, please, is a big ol' exception. When Comme de Garçon wants to do something extremely crazy and part of it has to be plastic, I, that's fine, that's cool with me. But for the most part, if I'm just looking for a shirt and it's like, look at this interesting thing I did with the shirt, but also it's 30% polyester, I'm not interested. But yeah, beyond that, I'm just looking for stuff that is different. I just want interesting things. I want your pattern to be weird. I want the finishings to be weird. I want the buttons to be like handmade leather stuff, whatever. I want things to be strange. Weird is good. Do you think I'll make it in the fashion game? Yes. What's gonna be trendy in 2024? I don't know, I kind of don't care, and whatever it ends up being, I'm going to stay very far away from it, and so should you. You're way too cool for trends. Let your lame friends worry about trends. You don't need to worry about them. Sh most shocking thing you recently found out about fashion. The Skims nipple thing was pretty crazy. Yeah, there will be no photographic <laughs> accompaniment with that statement. I mean, if you're looking for fashion tea, this is a terrible channel to check in on for that. <laughs> Honestly, the thing that fucked both of us up really bad was um, this story from forever ago while we were researching for the Comme de Garçon episode, which is, the best episode that we've put out in months. You should absolutely go watch that. Rei Kawakubo was being interviewed about a month after she did one of her most legendary shows of all time. And the interviewer rightfully asked her, could you please explain what that show was about? And Ray got out a white piece of paper and a black pen, drew a circle, rose from her chair and left the room. The interview had ended. That person was Susanna Frankel, it was for The Guardian. Isn't that crazy? You have to be like genius, genius, genius to be able to do stuff like that and it'd be okay. Like in order for like people to not just be like, oh, you're a crazy person. I'm, I didn't understand, you're an actual crazy person. Cause I am trying, like as someone who has interviewed dozens of fashion designers at this point, I'm trying to picture myself interviewing someone, asking them a question, pointing the microphone back at them and then them just sort of spiriting themselves away. Like I just, <laughs> I don't know if there's any circumstance under which I would be like, that was cool. This was a great interview. <laughs> Notable exceptions would be Colm getting interviewed on the floor. I, I believe he had stayed up for 48 hours prior to that interview trying to get everything done. So I, I understand why this one needed to happen. And actually, I enjoy doing that a lot, despite that floor being filthy. You do not understand how gross that floor was and how much I was having to be like, it's okay, it's okay, we're just gonna lay down, it's okay. And then also it was really crazy being at the Loewe showroom recently and then just seeing Jonathan Anderson walking around and just like straightening things. This was really crazy to me because I very strongly believe that people who are in a position of leadership need to be servants. And so the person who goes out there and is taking out the trash or making sure that things are straight and positioned or being like, I'll be the one to redo the rack, it's fine. That is a good that is a good sign in a boss. But then also you could tell that Jonathan very deeply cared about the way that his own work was being presented, that it, it was his business, how the clothes were sitting on the rack. And if something needed to be straightened, he was like, let's let's get it straight. This is great. But at the same time, not being a jerk. So I don't know. I, I got a really good impression from Jonathan Anderson there, even though I, I didn't even talk to him. I love you all so much. Go join the Patreon so you can get a bunch of exclusive videos. See ya.